All right, welcome back. Uh, we have a question here. Yes, go ahead. So in line with uh, the intercession that Jesus does for us, uh, the scripture also says that, you know, at times where we are groaning and uh, we are weak in the spirit or we are not able, and the spirit uh, you know, intercedes for us through understandings which our mouth can't utter. So how do you distinguish between that and what we yeah. also know? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So, see, the Holy Spirit is also referred to the spirit of Jesus. Right? The scriptures teach us uh, all through the new covenant also. So Jesus said, I will send you a helper. Right? It's not like Jesus is not doing the helping work, uh, like the intercession work. Right? So how there's there's no there's no like distinction, like okay, what Jesus is doing is different method, and what the Holy Spirit is doing is a different method. It's the same thing, right? One of the responsible or the the roles of the Holy Spirit. Is he is our is, is the spirit of intercession, right? He he enables us, like as you said, the word says, uh, when we don't we're not uh, not able to pray, he he enables us through groans and and he enables us to pray. So so it's not like Jesus is not doing it. Right? Jesus also is making intercession for us. So if you see, it, all three of them are one in a sense, right? So we know that. So, so we don't have to differentiate in a sense like, okay, so example, I'm not able to pray. Now, I just gave that example, right? I picture it that way. So the, the thing with me is I picture everything. So it could be somebody else and, you know, the, you know, the Holy Spirit is helping you. So I don't have to think, okay, is Jesus helping me or is the Holy Spirit helping me? Right? The point is that we're able to do it at that moment, right? So Jesus is our... He's he's making intercession for us, right now. For example, temptation. Jesus is making intercession, but the Holy Spirit is also there. No, He's there always with us. So we must be able to rightly know that. Okay, so it's not like is Jesus doing this or is the Holy? I hope you will get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So they they both they're all one. They're working in unity with one another, right? So. So the, the thing is, when I gave this example, what I said was, I, I just picture things like uh, everything. I just try to imagine things. Right? I imagine how Jesus did those miracles or how all, all through the Bible, whenever I read it, I try to imagine it so that it brings in reality for me. Uh, but but you can always, you know, you, you can go by these verses also, right? The Holy Spirit is our, uh, he, he's our helper. He helps us to pray. So we don't have to worry about who's doing it, but as long as it's getting done in our life, right? Uh, yeah, I hope that uh, answers your question, right? Okay. We are on, <clears throat> yeah, we're on page 28 on your notes, right? The old required many recurring sacrifices, but the new covenant, it's only one sacrifice that is going to continue to remain. The old has been removed and the new is in force. When we say removed, meaning the old, the laws, the law has been removed and the new is in force. The new is an everlasting covenant, meaning what? It doesn't need renewal. This place that we've taken needs renewing probably every five years. Do you want to renew the agreement? Yes. Okay. Renew. The new covenant doesn't mean after 100 years, Jesus has to come back and repeat the whole thing. No, it's an everlasting covenant. Till the end of time, one covenant established forever. Right? The new is a more glorious covenant. The new is better with better promises. Shedding off of the old covenant mentality. I know you've heard of this saying. It took... One day for Moses to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. One day. But it took more than 40 years to take out Egypt out of the Israelites. They were still had that Egyptian mindset. They were living in Egypt you know, for so long. I wonder, why, Moses, why did you bring us into the desert? The food, the cucumber is good. Can you believe they said that? 
the food, the cucumbers, we got good cucumber in Egypt. That at one point they said, they've gone till the, you know, the promised land. And they're telling Moses, let's, they're, they're all deciding, let's stone Moses, we'll kill him, we'll appoint a new leader and go back to Egypt. They can see the promised land. Old mentality. Sometimes we lock our blessings because of our own thinking. If I don't do it this way, God won't bless me. Or if I do it this way, only then God will bless me. No. You know, most of the time when I'm driving, I play speaking in tongues. I've downloaded it, speaking in tongues or Bible verses. Bible verses keep playing. You know, you get these things on YouTube, right? You can just download them. So continuously, one hour of Bible verses, one hour of speaking in tongues. So it's just there. Right? Now, it's not like in the old covenant, you have to go to the temple. You have to stand there. You have to. Pray. I'm just giving this example, right? So, so what I'm trying to say is the old covenant mentality should be removed. Don't try to go to God with your works. God, if I learn guitar and keyboard, will you make me a good worship leader? Right? No, you don't go to God like that. You learn guitar, you learn keyboard, you learn the instruments, whatever God has given you, and say, Lord, these are my gifts, these are my skills. Open doors for me that I can use them for your glory. That's the difference. Right? You, we, we need to come out of that old covenant mentality. Now, is the new covenant without law? Jesus himself said, I am the law. The new covenant is called the perfect law of liberty. James 1.25 But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James 2, 12 and 13. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. So right now, in the new covenant, we are in the law of liberty. The old covenant was the law of condemnation or the law of guilt. When I'm talking about that, I'm... You know, always remember, I'm talking about the law of Moses, right? The law of condemnation. Yeah. But in the new covenant, it's a law of liberty. What is the meaning of liberty? To live freely. Do you have the liberty in APC Bible College? Yes. You got to change that then. We didn't have any liberty. There are certain rules, and you got to follow those rules, right? In the New Covenant, we have the law of liberty, which means there was freedom at any time, at any place, at any moment. Those who worship the Father can worship Him in spirit and in truth. Liberty. We can go to the Father at any time, just the way we are. It's a law of liberty. There's freedom in his presence. If I can sit and pray, I can kneel and pray, I can prostrate and pray, I can walk and pray. You know, during the supernatural hour, all of you are in the outer courts there. The same presence is there. That's okay. Right? But why do I say everyone come in front? Because it's just bring in unity. But there's liberty during the worship. The, the Lord may minister to you in a different way, and he may minister to me in a different way. right? And the mistake I made when I was growing up was I have so much of you know zeal for God. I said, no, you have to pray like this. You have to worship God like this. I realized that, hey, I'm not living under the law. I'm living under grace. And God can speak in any way through any person and however he feels like. Right? So I don't have to make judgment upon people. Give people the liberty right? and let them make the choice on how they want to do things. Right? Now, the question comes up, 
why still read the old covenant why study old testament survey answer is here because god has not changed from the old covenant to the new covenant god has not changed malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 i the lord will not, not change is what that verse says the heart and nature of God remains the same across both testaments. Do you believe this? The heart and nature of God is the same, the old and the new? Or is it uh, Old Testament God is angry, New Testament God is happy? It's the same. The power and glory of God remains the same across testaments. But sometimes you read the Old Testament, Say, so, hey, God did so many wonderful miracles. New Testament, why are we not seeing those miracles? We may have those questions, but God has not changed. God has not changed. He's able to do the same miracles he did. He's able to still part the seas. He's able to do whatever he feels like doing. Nothing can stop him. Right? So God has not changed. Remember that. Now, how he works with people may change, right? Uh, how God worked with people uh, in the old covenant and how God is dealing with people now may change. But his heart and the nature of who he is, that will never change. He's a loving God. He's a zealous God. He's a caring God. He's merciful. He's faithful. He's just. He's a healer, deliverer. All of that is there. How he deals with people from the old to the new has changed. We learn from God's workings and dealings. We learn from God's how God worked and dealed with people in the old covenant. So when we look at stories and we read from the old covenant, how many of you like to read these stories of people? Do these case studies? Do these case studies. Look at Job. Have you ever thought of Job during the time of Abraham? Job was there enjoying his life. He had all the money, he had all the wealth family, children, everything was going well in his life. Righteous man. By evening, everything was going wrong in his life. What a lesson we can learn from it. Everything was going good. Did he have wife? Yes. Did he have children? Yes. Did he have money? Yes. Did he have servants? Yes. There was nothing that he lacked. Did he have good health? Yes. Everything was lost. In one day. And what a lesson it is. And how he, Job, was able to stand and say, I know my Redeemer lives. I know I'm going through this, but God does not change. Think of the stories of Daniel and Joseph and Moses and David. Think of that. You know, I keep telling stories when I drop my children to school. I keep telling them stories. I keep asking them, Who are you? I'm David. What did David do? He killed the lion and the bear in his own hands. Nobody saw that. But when the time came to stand in front of Goliath, he was unafraid. So, you, so I keep telling them, you may be doing great things. Nobody's watching you, but a time will come. You will stand for God. God will use you. You learn from these stories. And you apply it in your life. Look at the thing, you know, one of the best things I've learned from these stories of the old covenant is God makes his people wait. By nature, that's what he does. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited 40 years. Then who else? Joseph waited 17 years. David waited 17 years. Why? That's how he is. And so if I am waiting for blessings, it's not something new. This is not WhatsApp. You send one message, God will reply back immediately. God's dealing doesn't change. If you're waiting for something, wait. Wait in faith. Wait trusting God. But that's how he deals with people. Right? So we learn from it and we apply it in our life. We draw inspiration from those who walked with God in the old covenant. Yes? Right? There's so much that we can you know, get inspired by reading the word of God. Shepherd boy, God took a simple shepherd boy. What is his? What is the shepherd's work? Ah, come, we are going grazing, and then he's sitting there looking after. 
it's not a great job during that time, except when the lions and the bears come, he has to fight them. But simple shepherd boy to the king of Israel. Can you imagine that? King of Israel. You draw inspiration from this. You may be feeling, hey, I'm nothing. David was nothing. God took him and made him a king. So you draw and say, hey, yeah, right now, nobody is clapping for me, nobody is watching me, but one day God will put me up. Help me to be faithful now. So you draw inspiration. The old covenant points us to Jesus Christ. And there are about 300 verses in the old covenant which points us to Jesus and the prophecies that is fulfilled in him. About 300 verses. It points us to Jesus. Right? So we can always read it. There are types and shadows of the old covenant that are fulfilled in the New Testament. So what does it teach us? That the old covenant is not some, you know, the cross is not plan B. Oh no, Adam, Eve, I told you, no, don't eat the fruit. Now what to do? No. What does the Bible say? We preach Christ crucified before the foundations of the world. Right? So it is, it is not something that happened all of a sudden. There are types and shadows. God already knew it. Why did God tell Moses, don't hit the rock? First time he said, hit the rock. Water came out from that rock. And the rock followed them wherever they went. Can you think of that? Again, you need to imagine these things. Imagine a rock moving with you. And water is flowing from that rock. And they are taking water, drinking. Can you picture that? In the desert have you seen the deserts how it is hot windy and then there's water flowing they are drinking from that nobody has to say hey where, where's the water they can see it water is flowing from the rock continuously and then god told moses no no now you don't uh, hit the rock you speak to the rock right why was that it was a portrayal of who christ was the people of Israel were disobeying. They were doing whatever they felt like doing. God sent snakes among them. The snakes started biting people. They were dying. God said, Lord, let them not die. Okay, put a pole. Put a snake on it. When you look at that, they will live. Type of who Jesus is. Right? So, again, the lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Passover lamb here. So everything, most of them in, in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. There were types and shadows, things pointing to Jesus, right? Okay. What old covenant practices still remain? Let's read Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through 10. It's on your notes. Uh, Romans 13, 8 through 10. Go ahead. Anyone can read? Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And there any other commandments are all summed up in this saying. Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law okay thank you Gertrude so the Apostle Paul is making it very simple here okay it's he's talking to a mixed audience the Romans were there some of some were Jews some are Gentiles but he's saying now you have heard about the law you should not commit adultery you should what you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, you should not covet. You've heard about the law, the Ten Commandments. Now I'll tell you something. The Apostle Paul is saying, if you learn to love one another, two things: love the Lord your God, love one another. You have kept all the Ten Commandments. You have kept the law. Right. So what about the practices? I don't have to do those, you know, those sacrifices and all those practices that were there. But if I just love, 
Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Right? That's that's it. If I just learn to love God, love people, and walk in love, I fulfilled all of this. Right? And so, the old covenant practice, all of these, sums up in one: love the Lord your God, love one another. Right? And so, when you look at what's happening, when you look at these contrasts between the old and the new covenant, it's not like the old covenant is, is something that we do away with. There is a reason that the Bible has the old and the new covenant together. God has put it there for a reason. And so we can learn from it. Right? We can learn from people. We learn from their mistakes as well. What is something that we can learn from Solomon? What he himself learned, right? Towards the end of his life, he says, everything is vain. I did everything in life. Everything is vain. So let me tell you, just follow God, love God. That's the best thing. I have money. I enjoyed money. I enjoyed women. I enjoyed life as a whole. But none of them gave me any fulfillment. That's what he says. Ecclesiastes. Everything is vanity. Right. So we learn from these things, from the old covenant, and we apply it in our life. But which is a greater covenant? The new covenant. Right. So we stand on these new covenant blessings. We say, this is who I am. This is what Jesus did for me. And this is how I will walk in covenant with God. Okay. Okay. Let's get into chapter 7. Any questions? Those online? Okay. Okay, chapter 7, the new covenant in our daily living. Remember we talked about identity and how do we apply identity into our life, right? When this walk in this new identity. The same way, the new covenant, how do we apply it in our daily living? How can we apply it? Okay, let's look at it. First one, remember that we are his own special people. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Let's read. Anyone can read, please? We'll just go through these verses. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Yeah. That he would purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So the moment you and I become believers, we accept the Lord Jesus. We become his own special people. Right? So when you stand up in the morning, you wake up, and you look at yourself, say to yourself, I am God's special son. I'm, I'm God's special daughter. Because it says here, right? he gave himself for us to purify himself his own special people zealous for good works. So he calls us special. But you may not feel special. You may feel neglected. People may say things about you. But when God sees you, you are special. First Peter 2 9, very powerful. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You know, in the Old Covenant, it's, it's very easy to say this. But in the Old Covenant, being in a priesthood family was of great ranks. Aaron was the first high priest. right? And then followed the whole priesthood. And the Levites were given high importance during you know, the Old Covenant. They were given very prominent uh, you know, importance because they were people of the law. Now Jesus, you know, this verse is saying you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. So you declare this over your life, right? You are kings and priests. We are called to live differently. We have a new covenant culture. What does it mean to call to live differently? 
everyone are going and drinking and enjoying and doing everything in life but you are called to be different there should be a difference what does jesus say i will separate the goats and the sheep there will come a time he will separate there's a difference when you and i walk as new covenant people when you walk into your office there should be a difference if there's no difference something's wrong right to be a difference you live differently everyone are gossiping everyone are using bad words but you set yourself apart say no i will choose not to but everyone are using that's everyone but you are different you are not everyone right you live with a new covenant culture you live with a in the new covenant community that is walking in love walking in the provisions and blessings of the new covenant right there is and there's a lot of provisions there are a lot of blessings in the new covenant now only if we know it we can walk in it so we got to read god's word know what are the blessings you have in the new covenant right one thing that i can suggest you or encourage you to do is read deuteronomy 28 right read it uh, keep declaring it the first portion especially so 28 or 26 so do 28 okay yeah deuteronomy 28 just the first maybe the first 14 verses read it write down what who you are in christ write down the blessings that you have ephesians 1 you're seated with him in heavenly places i'm uh, and then uh, you know there are plenty plenty of verses in romans and corinthians i do not have the weapons the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they are mighty in god they pull down strongholds greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world what is all this you're walking in the provisions and the blessings of the new covenant speak it over your life declare it over your life right and then walk by faith jesus taught us to walk in faith walking in faith means walking in step with what god is doing right now hebrews 11 1 can we read that hebrews 11 1 i'm sure we all know this verse hebrews 11 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen yes thank you Lord. now now everyone say now now faith is the substance of things hoped for evidence of things not seen and you learn more in faith the class in faith but one of the prerequisites or one of the most important aspects of believers is to walk in faith you and i are living in faith who told you to believe in jesus you saw him your parents told you who told your parents and it just goes on the questions can go on and on you live by faith because you have experienced him in your life You've experienced God's blessings. You have experienced God working in your life. And we begin to live in faith. And the Bible, and Jesus talks about three aspects in faith. Right? You know, faith, he, once, he says, in one place he says, Oh, you of no faith. Where is your faith? Two, he says, you of little faith. Yeah, faith, but very little. Three, he says, this person has great faith. Yes, right? So, one of the prerequisites as believers is that we continue to walk in faith. Walking in faith enables us to walk in tune with God and positions us to receive the blessings of God. If I don't walk in faith, if I'm just walking just every day, okay, doing whatever I feel like, then there is no substance of things hoped for. That's what the verse says, no? Faith is a substance of things hoped for. I don't see it. I don't see heaven. I know one day I will be there in heaven. Right? Or, for example, 
you know, if you have children, I know one day my children will, you know, become, I go to drop my kids and I see these kid, these children who are in 10th standard. You know, they were writing, they're, they're all getting, preparing for board exams. I think, oh man, one day that will happen. These small boys will become, go to 10th standard. One day it'll happen. It's a, it's a hope that we see ahead. The Bible teaches us that we are to have a hope. We need to walk in this hope and walk in faith. Right? And that's that's something that we apply in our new covenant life. Right? Why are you studying here? Bible college? A certificate. Hope not. No, certificate is important. What I'm trying to say is, you know, you have the faith that when you study, you're spending time in God's presence, God is speaking to you, God is changing you, you're growing into the things of God, and God is going to use you in whatever He has called you for. Right? And so you begin to speak it over your life, declare it over your life, these new covenant blessings. Okay? So uh, what we'll do is we'll stop here, we'll not get into section two, but next class we'll get into section two, we'll talk about the cross. So we've completed the covenants. Right? Was it interesting, covenants? Right? Covenants is good, right? You and I are part of this part of a great good covenant. And uh, the best part is God has established the covenant. All we have to do is sign on the dotted line. Say, God, I agree with you. This is what you want for me. And I agree. And I sign the part of the covenant. And so we've completed on the covenants. Now, just because we finished covenant doesn't mean you take covenant and put it in the cupboard. Right? You've got to apply it in your life, right? Uh, remember that these covenants are to be lived out daily. Right? And we understand that you know, God has called us for a greater, bigger covenant than that of the old. Okay, so next class, uh, we'll get into the cross. And this is a powerful section, right? We talk about what the cross did. What's the centrality of the cross? What's the, what's the point of the cross? Why did God choose the cross? You know, Jesus, when he came, into, when he came, in every place he spoke and things were done. Yes? God said, let there be light. It was done. He spoke things into being. But he didn't speak salvation into being. He did it. He came, he shed his blood, he died on the cross. So he didn't speak it, he did it. So that we can speak it. You understand that? Right? So we'll talk about the cross, the centrality of the cross. What is the purpose of incarnation? A little bit of Christology there. How did Jesus foretell about the crucifixion? And what, what is the basis of the cross that we can stand on? Right? So we'll stop here. Any questions? On online? Okay. All right. Uh, I'd just like to invite anyone to please uh, close in prayer. Uh, even as you pray, just, uh, you know, just thank the Lord for what He has done. Right? He has brought us out of this covenant of bondage into the law of liberty, a covenant with greater blessings. So I just want to encourage any one of you, if you'd like to pray, and uh, just declare that over your, our lives, and then we'll close. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the learnings that we have been a recipient. We know, Lord, that uh, we are children of the new covenant. Help us not to undermine the finished work of the cross. Teach us to live, lead and live a life that which is pleasing in your sight. We thank you for all that you have enabled us to receive as your children through the blessings of the new covenant. We thank you also for the old covenant and for the reminder that the work that instead of we need to do, the work that is already done at the cross. We thank you for Pastor for his teachings and the insights that we gain and we learn on a day-to-day -day basis. We commit the rest of this course also into your precious care. We pray 
that we will not only be hearers of your word, but also doers of your word. We commit, ask, seek everything in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend. And I'll see you next week. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.